Hey folks, what's up? It's Jamie from Books and Ladders, and I'm here today with a non-spoiler review of The Bone Shard War by Andrea Stewart. This is the third in the Drowning Empire series, so if you haven't read The Bone Shard's Daughter or The Bone Shard Emperor, there might be some spoilers for that, but there are no spoilers for this book right here. Shout out to Orbit for sending me a copy of this, and you can see my full review on Books and Ladders, which I'll have the link down below for you. Back cover of this reads, Lin Sakai has won her first victory as Emperor, but the future of the Phoenix Empire hangs in the balance, and Lin is dangerously short of allies. As her own governors plot treason, the shardless few renew their hostilities. Worse still, Lin discovers her old nemesis Ni Song has joined forces with the rogue along Ragan. Both of them seek her death. Yet hope lies in history. Legend tells of seven mystic swords forged in centuries past. If Lin can find them before her enemies, she may yet be able to turn the tide. If she fails, the Sukai dynasty and the entire empire will fall. Two as a audiobooks and then read this obviously as a physical copy with the advanced one, but this series does have a lot of content warnings and I'm going to just have them somewhere around here on the screen for you to go through, but most egregiously there is a lot of human trafficking, assault, parental abuse and neglect, and also scenes of fantasy violence, which mix in death, blood, and gore. So if that is triggering to you and you need to step away from this video or the series, I won't be offended. I'll just catch you in our next video. This series overall is a bit of a slow burn. There's a lot of setup and build up for what the magic system is, how that interacts with the empire itself, and what it means to have bone shards and use bone shard magic. There's a lot of different rules around magic. Our heroes aren't really heroes, they might be kind of anti-heroes, but there's a lot of really good stuff mixed in with understanding who Lin is as a character and how she grows and advances throughout the series. I really appreciated her journey throughout the Bone Shard War to becoming who she needed to be without having to necessarily rely on others, but understanding where her strengths were and where she did need people in order to fill some of those gaps. I will say that in the audiobooks, I had a hard time distinguishing between some of the different point of views because there were five or six of the different point of views, but only three audiobook narrators. And while I love Emily Wu Zeller, it was a little bit difficult to distinguish between some of the different point of views. So I was kind of glad to pick this one up as a physical copy because I did get more of a sense of who the individual characters are. They really were able to shine through and it helped me really relate to some of those secondary point of view characters that weren't Lynn, that weren't Jovis, that really tied the rest of the story together and I was able to really see them as characters rather than caricatures. There are so many point of views. One of the things to note in all of these books is that each of the chapters kinds of ends on cliffhanger but it's not necessarily the same point of view in the next chapter. So sometimes you have to try and flip back and forth to say, wait, what happened before we left this character and where are we with them again? So that does take away a little bit from the enjoyment. It's obviously much easier to do that in a physical book than on audiobook because audiobook is a little bit more difficult to switch back and forth to. But I do think it added that element of intensity and really being on the edge of your seat while you're reading through because it kept you wanting to turn pages. Obviously, some of the downfalls with that is that you're waiting to get to that next point of view, so you might miss what's happening in especially those secondary character arcs. So if it's not Lynn or Jovis, you might be wondering, when am I getting back to them? Or why is this important to be put right in the middle of them? And that doesn't always make sense until some of those arcs overlap with one another. This last book really answered a lot of the questions that I think most readers had while they were reading throughout the entire series, especially around the magic system, why the islands were sinking, and how everything kind of tied together. I think there was a lot of really good points of this, and I'm trying not to spoil too much, but it was really that element of understanding the history, understanding the knowledge, and how those two things tied together. And it put into perspective some of the first emperor, so Len's father, what uh, his ideas were and how he put them into place and the why, why he ruled the way that he did. But I am really satisfied, obviously, with the conclusion of it because it did answer all the burning questions that I had. Now, I will do a spoiler right here. And if you want to skip it to see my overall thoughts for this, you can go to this time here. But I know everybody's really curious about what happens to Memphi, the little otter... I don't know what else to call him. He's a little otter creature that has horns. 
uh, and he's Jovis's companion. At the end of the last book, he was taken hostage, and everyone was really concerned, myself included, about what would happen to him at the end. So if all you care about is Mephi, like I did, then you'll be happy to know that he survives. <laughs> Mephi is alive, Mephi's thriving. I'm very happy for Mephi at the end of this novel. That's all. So what do I think overall? Well, I definitely think and recommend picking up this series. I thought there were a lot of really good elements to it. I really enjoyed the fantasy and it's definitely not for fast paced, fast adventures. There's a lot of slow burn. This book takes place two years after the events of the last one. So there's even a time skip and then some jumping around in time. And that's not for the faint of heart. There's a lot of things that I think end up getting an explanation, but there's a lot of questions you have while reading the first two books that don't get explained until this one. And while that's beneficial for some people, others might not appreciate this. I would say that this series is on par with things like Black Sun by Rebecca Rowanhorse, which I reviewed on the blog, so you can read that down below, or even The Jasmine Throne by Tasha Suri. Both of those have those slow burn elements, a lot of build out of what the world is, and how that interjects with a lot of the mythology and history and the fantasy and the magic aspects. So if you were fans of those, or if you're a fan of this and looking for a new read, now you have some cross comparison to see. Again, thank you to Orbit Books for sending me a copy of this and for all the other books that you sent me, including the Children of Memory and Time series that I'm going to get to next. I appreciate every time that a publisher works with me and decides to take a chance on my review and my thoughts on a book because they are not always as positive as they are for this one. If you want to see more of my review or reviews in general, you can always check out other videos that I've posted or you can go to my website, which is booksandladders.co.uk for all of the books that I've reviewed, series I've reviewed, or even authors that I've been able to interview. Until next time, bye!